I'm so excited about today. I have been uh, praying about this and kind of really laboring through it, and you'll see maybe why in a moment, but I've really been praying about this sermon series entitled, Why I Serve, for several weeks, possibly even a few months. And I believe it to be very timely uh, as we enter into the summer, and a lot of times um, we can kind of begin to travel a lot, and a lot of things. And that's great. I think you should. I think you should get some time away with your family. I think that's incredibly important uh, as you do that. Don't forget to to watch, like I hope many of you are doing today online. We want to say welcome to our online campus, the folks that are watching. Go down to the bottom left hand side and hit that share button and share the sermon. Maybe be an encouragement to someone else. But uh, we believe that. Um, Around here, there's a mantra that we adopted from the moment that we started Northridge Church, and that is this, love God and reach people. We believe that that is not something that we necessarily coined. We believe that to be absolutely the gospel. Jesus was asked by the religious crowd of the day, what is the greatest commandment of all? And he said, you should love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then as he paused, they kind of leaned in, and he said, and the second one is likened to it. It's like the first one, and that is to love your neighbors yourself. Now, you got to understand something. We maybe blow right past that question and answer because we don't realize what they knew and what they would have lived by, that there were 613 laws according to the Old Testament, Mosaic and Levitical law, the thou shalt and the thou shalt not, 613 that literally became somewhat of the, the measuring rod, the litmus test for one's faithfulness. Now keep in mind, having said that, there were ten uh, commandments that kind of encompassed all of those other laws. And then Jesus brought it into two. But then as he was resurrected, he came back and he said, oh, but really it's kind of all founded and rooted in one thing. People can know you're my disciples based on how you love other people. And I want to kind of throw this word out there that in loving people, we serve them. Jesus said these words as he spoke over his disciples. He said, look, I've not come into this world to call you my servant. I've come into this world to call you my friend. Because a servant does not know what his master is doing or what his intent is or what he's thinking. But I have made all things clear to you. Jesus told us why he came. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, I'm not come to be served, but to serve you. He even showed that in one of the greatest forms in the Last Supper, in that pinnacle moment before he would go and be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane as he knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. Peter, of course, pretentious Peter, stood up and said, I'm not going to have any part of that. You're not going to wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. And Jesus said these profound words, and don't miss this, in the context of why I serve, he says, if you do not allow me to wash your feet, then you can have no part of me. And Jesus said, I mean, and Peter said to Jesus, he said, they're not my feet only, but my head and my body also. He's basically saying, I want all in. See, the reality is this serving is not something that Northridge Church has, has built up and said, hey, you need to sign the serving list and need to be a part of the serving team and you need to volunteer and you need to hold a door. Can I tell you something? All of that, it has to converge. It has to cross a point where it matters more than the service that you're performing. Please know. The people that get here at 7 o'clock, 7.30, and put out signs that say, welcome home, it's not about the person putting out a sign. It's about the message of that sign that might can grab the heart of a broken, undone, disenfranchised person who drives through this front gate looking for a reason to live. Or maybe a reason to not live. And we want to give them the second they drive in the fact that, hey, maybe, just maybe, you found home here at Northridge. Then they drive up to the top, and then they're smiling faces with vests on so you don't hit them. And they're standing there, and they're like motioning. And I actually had the privilege of serving in that capacity uh, several weeks ago. It was a blast. I think I did better than that than I did preaching. You don't have to say amen right there. It was awesome. I and mean, people waving, and people, it was just amazing. But they're not parking cars to be parking cars. You see, they're standing there to fulfill a need, no doubt, but they're standing there to say, hey, you're important. You are valuable. And then once they cross the parking lot, across the road, and, and, and they get up here, maybe, just maybe, someone would have met them outside and says, hey, let me open the door for you. Welcome home. Or maybe if it's raining, hopefully someone took an umbrella and ran out there and met you. It's not about the umbrella. It's not about the rain. It's not about you getting wet. 
Then you walk in and somebody says, hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? Can I get you, you know, ice water? Can It's not about those things. Those things are important. But watch this. It's about in our service, we allow people to see Christ in me. In hopes that, in hopes that, as I serve, others may come to know him. Do do you get that? The, the, The trueness of why I serve is rooted not in my act of service alone, but in the reason that I do it. That's why we've entitled it why. We cannot forget the why. You see, you go back into the 1960s, for example, in the civil rights movement. You look at Martin Luther King Jr. who stood on the, on the, on the, on the steps of, of the, the Washington Mall, the monument. 250,000 people gathered. You say, oh yeah, Mark, but they were all a bunch of African Americans. It was just trying. No, no, no. 75% of the people there that day were middle class white Americans. Why is that? I'll tell you why that is. It was the why. Because I realize as I read back and and study the story of this man, watch this. He's not the only one that had a dream. Are you kidding me? He's not the only one who who wanted to fight for civil rights. Man, there were thousands and thousands of people around the country. But watch this. His why is what set him apart from everyone else. That's why anyone cared to listen. you got to remember, the day that he went forth and gave that great speech of, 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 I have a dream. Watch this. He didn't have internet. The newspaper didn't care. Nobody cared at that particular moment because so many people didn't want it to happen. But when you're doing something for the why and the cause is bigger than you and bigger than your right now moment, it's going to outlive you. People will take note. What was the why? The why was not just about civil rights in his moment. He says, I'm believing for a day where my children... He was speaking of the next generation because now we know in retrospect, looking back, he never saw that come to fruition. He was killed. Did he know that? I don't know. Did he suspect that could happen? Absolutely he did. His life was threatened every day. But he said, I have a dream. I have a desire. I have a why. And the banner of my why is that one day my children can grow up And be looked at, be measured by, be counted by the content of their heart rather than the color of their skin. Now that's a noble why. I can get behind that. And that one moment of why perpetuates still today. You see, that's what you and I have to do on our why. Please, please don't sign up to serve if your why is to make the preacher happy and he'll leave you alone and quit asking you to serve. I just got some of y'all's grill, didn't I? We, 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 don't, we don't go down here and cut grass. Where's Kenny Skinner at? Kenny Skinner's cut 500 acres, I bet, over the last year. And we don't even have that many. He's cut neighbor's yards. He's not cutting grass because we just need grass cut. He's cutting grass because he realizes that the presentation of the yard, when people drive on here, they won't look at it and go, man, I wonder why they didn't cut the grass. It removes that element, Kenny, and they drive in here and it looks a little bit groomed. And maybe, just maybe, that's the person, one of the 37 people that came to know Jesus at Rush Weekend. It is going to happen again at Rock the Ridge. It's not about building a zip line. Are you kidding me? That's not in the Bible. They went down zip line into glory. I mean, it's not in there. It's not in there at all. I know this guy's going to get upset with me for saying this, but Steve Pierce didn't bring a piece of equipment out here and and, and fix our road just just so he could come out here and find something to do. Although his wife said, please keep him out there for weeks on end. (laughs) I know that's not true. Well, maybe it is. But, but he knew, watch this, he knew that his vans and buses and people came along that road that it was important that they not ride in the ruts and the ditches and, and fall over that they could get in and get out and it would be somewhat presentable. Because we realize, watch this, that our serving has to have a why. And the why, my friend, is Jesus. If you have your Bibles today, I'd love for you to turn with me. I'm not going to get far today. I, I already know that I'm not because I believe God has already, man, if I could just be real honest, he's already wrecked me with this. 
I mean, this is so incredibly poignant to me in my life. John chapter 15. John is such a different writer. He calls himself the one who Jesus loved. How narcissistic is that? Or was it just a confidence in realizing that his Savior, his friend, his Messiah, loved him the way that he said he did? And he writes in John chapter 15. He says, I am the true vine in chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Some translations say he's the gardener. Some say he's the husbandman. In either case, he's the keeper of the vine. Keep in mind here, we're speaking metaphorically, as you see this unfold, about Jesus himself who is speaking. He said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he said, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You already are clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Watch this, and here it is, and I want you to grab this. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless, everybody say unless, unless you abide in me. Notice the capitalization of the word me and I. Those are speaking of deity, speaking of Jesus, Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says, again, if that weren't enough, I am the vine and you are the branches. Well, that seems a little redundant, doesn't it? No, no, no. Anytime you read something in the Word of God, one time, take note. But if you read it two times, it comes as a witness. You read it three times, it's really speaking of something that gives you that resurrection power. Hear me. Three is the number for resurrection. On the third day, Jesus got up defeating death, hell, and the grave. Now watch what he says. The second time, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Oh, and if there's any debate on what I said a moment ago, he says it again. For without me, you can do, say it with me, nothing. Guys, what a strong word that is. If I can take a little parenthetical for just a moment and say this, that tells me then, if I'm not abiding in him, yet I'm serving at every single thing that's going on, guess what? I am doing nothing. Hey, let's get up here where where it's personal. If I'm a preacher, I come in here every week and I preach with passion, excitement, An influx of my voice because something matters. Maybe shed a tear because it becomes emotional. But without me, Mark, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, here it is again. Watch this. He is cast out as a branch and he is withered. And they gather them, the workers, and throw them into the fire. And they're burned. My friend, I want you to hear me loud and clear. Heaven and hell are realities of eternity. And and it's very spelled out specific what God has called us to do. There's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And I believe with all of my heart, God sent me here to tell somebody today, let's remove ourselves from everything else going on for just a moment and hear this. It's time to quit playing games with our faith. God sent me here today to tell somebody, it's time to get serious about your faith. He gave you his life. Have you given him yours? And then lastly, and then I'm going to pray. Third time, resurrection. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So then will you be my disciple. Let us pray together today. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this word that you hold above your own name. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus today that you would help me to rightly divide it in these few minutes that we have. In your power, for your glory. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen.
believe with all of my heart that the greatest display of our faith is whether or not we are simply locked in, connected to, getting our nutrition from, abiding in Him, period. And the evidence of that is this, that if, watch this, and this is, I picked this particular tree, it's a crepe myrtle, I picked it specifically to help illustrate another truth, that deep in the ground, in the soil, the roots, that's the vine that he's speaking of. It's that that is rooted in the rock of our salvation. That's Jesus. And that's where the nutrition comes from. If I want to fertilize this tree, I do not throw the fertilizer on top of it. It'll burn the leaves. But rather, I would cast it around the root system. And there's a method to that. I won't get into all of that. And, and, it, and it draws in through the root system, the true vine. And then from there, it feeds up the, 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 the branches here and then outwardly up into a point of producing fruit. Pretty elementary. Our life is the same way. It's not complicated. This is, this is you. You're the branch. He is the true vine. Now, why do I have three bases? Because I believe that that is rooted and founded, no pun intended, in the person of Jesus the, the Savior, the Holy Spirit the Comforter, and God the Creator, but they operate as one. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're one. So just to give you a kind of a visual, I want you to understand that. But what he's saying in his word, he says that if you, and I want you to look at it this way, not you and the person, but if you abide, if you're connected to this system, you're going to get your nutrition. You're going to get the living water. You're going to get the food. You're going to get the emotional support. You're going to get the spiritual know-how. You're going to get everything you need needing in life if you as a branch are connected to this true vine but if you're not then you're going to be withered up and you're just going to be burned and here's the problem Here, here's the reality that I want to spell out to you today if if you right this moment are believing God for the greatest miracle you can fathom in your life, and maybe that's you today. If you're today standing in wait for God to manifest an answer that you have cried out to God for. I mean, man, I'm talking about you're praying for healing of cancer. You're praying for a healing of a broken marriage. You're praying for a wayward child, one that's gone so far. And he said, I don't want anything to do with this, God. And you're believing God for the impossible. You don't have to raise your hand, but is that anybody in this room today? Is that anyone watching today? I want you to hear me loud and clear. Because this has rocked my world. That if this is me, if this is me, and I am not attached to the source, I do not care how hard you pray. I don't care how much you fast. I don't care how wonderful you worship. I don't care how splendid and how amazing your eloquent words are. You can do nothing. You're not attached to the true vine. Oh, oh, we can bring everybody together, man, and, and this is you, and we can come down, and we can pray over you, and you, someone can prophesy over you, and someone can speak over you, and, and you can fast, and, and we can just pray that you would just start to bear fruit, man, of this prayer that you're believing God for. Let me, let me do you one more. In the Bible... Phrases like dead and lame and blind and deaf were used in conjunction with people who were lost. Because if they're lost, they're dead in their trespasses. Well, Mark, I'm a pretty good guy. I don't, I don't want to hurt nobody. I wouldn't have. Oh, no, 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 you were born in your sin. You were born in iniquity. You were born depraved and separated from God. You were born away from the true vine. And watch what happens. You're lame. You can't walk. There's an old gospel song. I can't even walk without him what? Without him holding my hand. I can do nothing by myself. And you can pray and you can pray and you can pray. But if you're not locked into the true vine... You can do, say it with me, nothing. Say it with me again. You can do 
nothing. Oh, but goodness gracious, if I am locked in, the byproduct, the default of simply being locked into the true vine is I'm just going to bear fruit because of him. Oh, my goodness, somebody needs to hear this today. You are trying so hard, man, and you look amazing, and you're a phenomenal person, and you're believing God, but you are not locked in. Well, Mark, what if this is me over here, and I want to get over here? The Bible says that Jesus, who was a Jew, who came of Jewish descent to a Jewish nation, to a Jewish people, to God's people, they rejected him. They said no to the true vine, and then you and I, the Gentile nation, the church, we were grafted into that. Now, anybody that knows anything about gardening knows that if I wanted to grow a crepe myrtle separate from this, I could put this in a rooting material and I could plant it in a moist uh, soil and it would begin to grow its own roots. But I'm not talking about abiding alone. I'm talking about abiding in the vine as the band comes back out. Listen. So there's a way to graft this in, that I would shave a little part of this, I would shave a little part of that. There's a certain kind of tape, there's some material I put on, and believe it or not, it can actually be grafted in and grow again. See, you and I were grafted in when we said, watch this, I accept you as the Lord of my life. Now, here's the hard part. Here's, here's the hard part for you and me. You're believing God for something so big. I heard a pastor say this one time, and I'll, I'll kind of pull this if I may. What if God told you to go to the graveyard and to pray just one person out of the grave? Just one. I mean, I'm not talking about a mass exodus out of the grave. People getting, I mean, that'd be freaky. Come on, just one, man, not a mass revival. Just one person that you're going to go to the graveyard and you're going to cry out and cry out and cry out and cry out and cry out. He just want one, just one, maybe one that hadn't been dead a long time, that kind of thing. One person to just walk out and go, man, thanks for the prayer. I'm alive. I, I get, work with me. I know you think this is silly, but hear me. Do you know who you would take with you to help you pray that person out of death and into life? Who would you take? You know what I'd do? I'd take somebody who's locked into Jesus. That can get a hold of the one who created, the one who redeemed, the one who can heal, the one who can, hear me, the one who can raise the dead. I say, Mark, why do you keep using that language? I'm glad you asked. The reason, the reason that I serve it's because every time I serve someone, I hopefully point them to Jesus. They come in here, they hear this message of hope found only in Jesus. We talk about Jesus. We do it for the glory of Jesus. All of those things transpire. Here's what I believe. If somebody raises their hand and says, Lord, save me, I believe that we just saw a dead person come to life. <laughs> and no disrespect intended. Do you really get that? I, I know that was a point. What did they do? Throw a plaud up there on the board? Or did you really get that? Do, do you really realize that when a person walks down this aisle, they have no hope, they have no identity, they have no purpose, they have no future, they have nothing because they are dead. Oh, and by the way, I could throw this in here. Dead people can't talk, they can't see, they can't walk, they can do nothing. So that encompasses all the other, the lame, the blind, the deaf. Dead people can do nothing. But oh my goodness, I love when somebody of this bankrupt of life steps into this circle and says, Jesus, save me. And they become alive forevermore. That is a resurrection from the dead and into the marvelous light of Jesus. Now, I won't even get into the things that I wanted to say today because I want to go to this because I feel the Holy Spirit has laid this on my heart that this was not even a part of my message, but I believe it's for somebody here today. 
I want you to notice the beauty at the top of this branch. Look at these beautiful crimson flowers. I want you to look at that today because that is a picture of you guys who are abiding in Christ. Man, praise God for you guys. I mean, you're abiding, you're praying, you're believing, you're, you're reminding yourself every day the hope that is in you, which is founded and rooted in Christ. He's the comforter because my life is uncomfortable. He is the power within me that raised Jesus from the dead. I'm abiding in him and he in me, and I can do anything in him, and my fruit will remain. That's my goal, man. That's the why. This is where we want to be. Let's pick out the one that's, uh, yeah, there it is, there it is. Check it out, check it out. Man, look at this one. It's got like, look at all that. So, so here's somebody, and man, that, that, that's deserving of an applause. You know, somebody that's just locked into him. Man, you're serving. You're seeing fruit, man. People are coming to know Jesus. Bless your heart. And all of a sudden, you're just minding your own business, man. Just abiding in Him. Spiritual nutrition is there. The living water's flowing. There's a, there's a spring of life coming outside of you. Everybody that surrounds you sees it, man. They see Jesus all over you. You're so graceful. You're so kind. You never complain about serving because you realize it's not about serving. You're not trying to please anybody. You're serving because Jesus serves you, and you get to. You don't have to. And, man, fruit is just flourishing. And people are, man, I'm thankful for him, man. And, man, she's amazing. And how, you won't believe he just stopped and prayed with me. Hey, this guy came up to me and put some money in my pocket, not even realizing that I couldn't even make my house payment. I mean, on and on and on. You are bearing fruit. And it's just the most amazing thing. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's so aromatic. It just is perfect in every way. And then all of a sudden, you're minding your own business. And you're doing church. And you're doing functions. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, oh, my gosh, this is beautiful. This is so amazing. What just happened? Why would a God who loves me? I mean, man, are you kidding me? Look how beautiful that is. I mean, I'm a part of the church this, that people are talking about. I'm bearing fruit on Monday. I'm bearing fruit in the line at Walmart. And God just came in and said, man, that is so beautiful. Well done. And then that's me, and I'm like, God, are you kidding me? I, mean, I must be walking in some generational curse. You're mad at me because of what my, guy, my granddad did. Well, maybe I'm doing it with the wrong heart. Maybe, maybe my motives were wrong. No, no, no. If you're not connected to the vine, you'll bear no fruit, my friend. But if you're connected to the vine, the default of that is you will bear fruit. But then he says these words. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes. <laughs> maybe, maybe you've never been pruned before. But I suggest to you that when I have been pruned, it hurts. It's defaming. You get that sick gut feeling, man, like you failed, and you get that just turning and twisting in your spirit. What do you want, God? What, what do you want from me? I mean, are you kidding me? I'm there every time the door. God says, I know you are. I know who you are. I know why you are who you are. I know the plans that I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset with you. You're not walking in a generational curse. Because my word says that I will visit the iniquities of the fathers to the fifth and the sixth generation. But oh, but those who love the Lord, I will bless them to a thousand generations. You're not cursed. You're abiding in me and me and you. And you are bearing much fruit. But it's time. Because Ecclesiastes said, Mark, because there's a time for everything under my creation. There's a time to laugh. And oh, we love to laugh. But there's a time to mourn. There's a time to 
be born and there's a time to, to die. Hear me. There's a time to plant. And there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. There's a time to flourish. And there is a time, my friend, that in flourishing, God will prune you. He will cut you back. And man, you're out here. You're way out here and you're so progressing in your faith. And then he looks at you and says, Clip, I need you back over here. And right there, hear me and I'm done, hear me. That's your defining moment. Talking to me. Many of us, when that happens, we get afraid. We get mad. We question God. We curse Him. We shake our fist at Him. Are you kidding me? Or you can look at that and say, I know what you're about to do. You're about to make that branch that was broken off here. You're about to make it grow out to here with so many more limbs and so many more extractions and so much more fruit. Oh, and that fruit, that fruit will remain. I need to tell somebody today, man. I, need, I feel God has sent me into this room today to tell somebody, you need to embrace the pruning. You need to abide in Him. But when you're abiding in Him and bringing forth the fruit, you need to wrap your arms around a loving God who says, I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset with you. You're not walking the wrong path. You are doing exactly what I've called you to do. But I'm cutting you back because I am fixing to expand you. I'm not demoting you. I'm setting you up for a promotion so that you would bring forth more fruit. Which one of those are you today? Is it just self-evaluation? Is this you? This new, new, new shoot off that's going off right here that's just kind of, is that you? You're abiding in Him. Praise God for you, man. Praise God for you, ma'am. Are, are you a little bit more? You've, you've been in church a long time. You're, you're serving. You're, you're, is this you? You see the progression? Or, or, or. And you're running through all the motions. But you're not attached to the source. Or is this you? To the world, he would say, what a waste. Some of you, even in this room, cringe when I broke it off. But God says, oh, no, no, no. That's what I have to do truly bring forth great fruit in your life. I ask you to bow your heads with me. All over the room, if you're watching today on live stream, I ask you to stop right where you are and just bow with me. Which one are you? Which one do you want to be? C could, could you pray this prayer? God, I'm not abiding in you, but I want to be. Help me to be grafted back in. What, what about this? I'm new to the faith, but God, I, I am locked into you with everything I have. Use me. That's why I serve, that your name may be made famous. Or maybe you could say today, and here's the tough one. Mark, I am producing some of the most beautiful fruit in my life that I've ever dreamt of. Dream for this moment. Could you say this? God, I'm ready. I'm ready for your next step in my life. Prune me. Could you invite him to do that? Prune me. My friend, he's not going to hurt you. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. But I do want to be bold in telling you this. It may not be fun. Before I even get to the moment of salvation, how many of you, heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to come to you, but you just lift your hand up to heaven and say, prune me. 
Oh, my goodness. The hands that are going up all over the room. Prune me. Hold them up. I know it's a scary moment because you're like, once I raise my hand, he heard my, pr- my prayer. He already knows your heart. Hold it up. Prune me. Prune me that I may bear more fruit. God bless you for being so willing to do that. Hands can go down. If you don't know Jesus today as the Lord of your life, man, oh, man, oh, man, today's your day. You may be wondering why your life is just kind of hitting dead ends. It's because you're not attached to the true vine. But you can do that today. I know the gardener. I know the vine dresser. I know the creator of the trees and the plants and the world they're in. I know the one who can make it happen in a second. Just pray with me. In faith. Nothing magical about this prayer, but it is as sure as gravity in this world. It is certain that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray with me? If you're not certain of your salvation and you want to be attached to the person of Jesus, pray with me. Father in heaven, I believe in Jesus. And I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart to save me, to redeem me, to attach me to the true vine. Forgive me of all my sin. Be the Lord over my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you pray that today in faith, I wonder, will you right now lift your hand and say, Mark, I prayed and I invited Jesus into my heart. God bless you.